Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I think I know most of you, but if I don't know, if I don't know you, my name is Martin. I'm one of the pastors in our sort of family of churches, churches, plural, yeah, uh, us here at Kintour, and then uh, the sister church over at Hillview. Uh, so it's a real privilege again to be here. Absolutely love uh, coming here and worshiping with you guys and, and enjoying the time before. Uh, church in the prayer meeting with, with Paul and Judy want to encourage you that that's happening every every Sunday morning 9.45. I made it at 10 today and it was still worth it. So if you're late, that's okay. They're very gracious. They did not mention the fact that I was late. Isn't that kind of them? That's who Paul and Judy are. They're not going to call you out. So even if you can just make it for 20 minutes, um, I know that you'd be so welcome at that time. I'm really grateful to them for just their, their heart of prayer. Uh, and how they lead us in that. So we're, we're continuing along. Uh, we're, I think, almost two-thirds of the way through our series through Haggai. Uh, Haggai chapter 2 today, verses 1 to 5. So if you don't know where that is in the Bible, it's about, I guess, three-quarters of the way through. Uh, and uh, if you find Matthew, go back three books from there, and you'll find Haggai. And uh, it's a small book, just two chapters. But we've gone quite slow uh, through this, this is, um, I think, message six of nine uh, that we've taken through Haggai, and it's just been, to me, it's been so encouraging just to reflect back on this incredible word uh, from the Lord through the prophet Haggai, and uh, I think there's much in this book for us to reflect on and ponder, may God guide us as we come around his word. I want you to just reflect on those words, his arms are strong enough to carry us through it all. Through this time as well, I want you to think of yourself as being held safe and secure in the arms of God in heaven as we come to this time. Uh, what a gift it is that his spirit ministers deep into our soul. He knows every single one of you. He knows what has been going on in your heart and your life this week. And uh, he is kind and gracious and he has spoken to us and he has revealed his son Jesus Christ and his word. And this is what we come to this morning. So... Know yourself, feel yourself being held by the Lord as we come to his word this morning. I wonder what crosses your mind if I say the phrase, the good old days. The good old days, it has to be preceded by a long, ah, doesn't it? Ah, the good old days. I guess for many of us, uh, as we hear that, there's maybe a, a bit of an eye roll that might come because it's a bit of a cliched phrase, isn't it? And we, we can probably use it to, to poke fun at maybe those who are too idealistic about a certain time in the past. But actually, I think for, for all of us at various times, there can be a tendency to look back on certain moments in life, certain seasons with a certain wistfulness and pining. Um, so we've been thinking a lot recently, my daughter just over a month, well, about a month ago, uh, left for university. So Lindsay and I have been thinking a lot about the good old days, you know, like the good old days when my daughter didn't abandon us and leave us bereft and heartbroken. Uh, or the good old days as well, just been thinking about university days, thinking back to what she's going through. And, oh, you know, and I have to admit, you know, we, as we thought of the good old days, we have said to Bethany, you know, it wasn't like that when we were at uni, we haven't you known that I roll comes. But we can do this, can't we? Thinking about the good old days. We do it in our personal lives. We do it in church life, don't we? Even if we don't have personal experience of something, certain pictures can grow in our mind as we think about the story of the church, and maybe particularly in this part of the world. And we talk a lot about how the, the landscape of the church has changed in Scotland. Over the decades, I remember driving through one of the very small villages right in the north coast of Scotland. And in this small village, I forget which one it was, but in this small village, there were three large church buildings. And we were just reflecting as a family that at some point, not that long ago, a few decades ago, those three buildings and the communities that gathered there would have been in the very heart of the community. Not just in terms of worship, and uh, celebrating God's gospel, but certainly that, but also in terms of recreation and social life and just general well-being in the community, education as well, all these sorts of things. The church would have been at the very heart of it. Ah, the good old days, we can think. 
And we can do this perhaps with our own story of engagement with church. You know, if you're, I think all of us have ups and downs in our, in our journey of faith. And, and we can maybe be feeling on top of the world in terms of how we're feeling about Contour Community Church and the path that God has for us. Or, or maybe and or, we can look back and remember other days when perhaps things seemed brighter. We were more encouraged. Um, so I mentioned this, this family of, of churches and uh, my first engagement with this family of churches was via uh, International Baptist Church in 2002 uh, when I arrived as youth pastor. And at that time, IBC, uh, now Hillview Community Church, but it was then International Baptist, had been going through a really tough time. It was actually coming out of a really difficult season at the start of the millennium. And one of the things that I realized very quickly was how people used to speak of the good old days. And actually, people used to speak of the 80s and the 90s at IBC as incredible moves of God. And people would tell these amazing stories of what God used to do in the life of IBC and how God used his saints, his church, to do wonderful things. Now, in one sense, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It is good to celebrate moments when God has worked in incredible ways. It is good to celebrate what God has done in, in the lives of heroes of the faith that can inspire us. And it's a very biblical thing to do, actually. One of the things that we see in the scriptures is the, the, the repeated retelling of the story of God. God reminds his people, I am the God who took you out of Egypt. I'm the God who's steadfast in love and faithfulness. And there's a lot of inspiration that we can take as we do that, reflecting on the past. But if we're not careful, it can sometimes lead to, to disappointment and discouragement. Ah, the good old days. We're not there anymore, are we? Maybe not thinking of good to our community church. I think, broadly speaking, as you zoom out, the story of our little family of faith is one of great excitement. There is a lot of movement forward happening here. It's wonderful to reflect on that. But certainly, whether we think of life in our own church family or the bigger picture, we can realize the struggles that we're facing in this world in which we live. And we can feel we're not there anymore, are we? And that can be difficult. Now, this is what God's people were dealing with in Haggai chapter 2. So we'll just read the first five verses of Haggai chapter 2. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. Amen. So I want us to try and understand this context a little bit. This context of despondency and discouragement. We see the people here are in great need, aren't they? For a start, they're just in the, the sort of tough early days of a huge practical building project. Now, some of you can relate to that. We, we have been working hard. I say we as a community of faith. I can't include myself personally in that number. But many of you guys have known that reality of, oh my goodness, there's still an awful lot to do here, isn't there? And we all know that in, in the early days of a project, it can feel more, it can feel like you're, you're making less progress than you actually are. You know, even if you're thinking of tightening out a room or a garage, the, the, the initial moments of that, you're making more mess then that you're actually bringing any order and clarity to that place. And I think it can feel discouraging. And certainly if you're doing a building project, the initial few weeks can feel like, oh, are we making any progress here? Now, there's another reason 
Why the work might have seemed slow in getting going to do with the calendar of God, which we're going to come back to in just a little while. But the point here is that things were just tough and slow for these people in this moment. They weren't making the progress that they had wanted to make. God had called them to this awesome thing, but it just felt tough for them. Now, we can relate to this, can't we? I have to just be honest with you. <laughs> one of the things that I have to do regularly as, as one of the pastors in the church is to apologize to people when things aren't happening as quickly as they would like. <laughs> and regularly I'm having to say, I'm sorry, we're not, you're right. It would be good to see this progress in this issue or with this project or with this ministry. You're right, it would be good to be stepping forward with more conviction and certainty. I'm sorry that we're not. We're, you know, here's multiple reasons, many of them to do with my own struggles and shortcomings, and, to, and just the reality of working as, as a body in a tough context. We don't always make the progress that we would like to, and that can be discouraging, right? Even when we ex ac accept the many huge encouragements there are, there are always things that we can say, oh, we're not seeing as many people get baptized as we would love to. We're not seeing as many people healed and, and set free from struggles and difficulties. We can always have this sense of, of, of man, we're in a, a tough moment. Uh, and and the, the, the thing that we have to think about here as well particularly is the reason for the tough moment that these people are feeling. So yes, there's just a sense of, okay, God, we're not moving forward as fast as we would like, but there's also something specific going on here in verse 3. Verse 3 speaks of this former glory of the temple. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Do you hear this sense of, ah, the good old days? And they really were special. This temple had been destroyed 67 years before this point. So, so some of the crowd that Haggai was sharing this message from God with, some of them would have remembered, maybe not many, but some of them would have seen this temple in its former glory. Now that's interesting, right? 67 years ago. Earlier I was speaking about that day that we can think back to when the church in Scotland was, was flying high for God's, for Jesus' sake. And interestingly, I think it's about 67 years ago. As we would think to that point, that would take us to, if anyone's good at maths, you'll have figured this out already, 1956. 67 years ago from today, 1956. And I just want to throw up a couple of pictures just to show you something. First of all, this is membership in the Church of Scotland. Now, I don't know if you can see the scale along the bottom there, but right where it peaks is towards the end of 1920 to 1960. So almost exactly 67 years ago. 1956 is the peak, the former glory, you might say, of the church in Scotland. Now, the Baptist Union of Scotland, of which we are part of the family, is no different. Here, the scale along the bottom uh, is 1950, and then the second mark is 1970. So maybe a little bit later here, maybe 1960s, early 60s, was the peak of the BUS membership there. And um, I think m many people were reflecting that Billy Graham had a significant mission to Scotland in the 50s, and off the back of that, the church grew, and, and since then, it's been a, a tough season for the church. Would you say, ah, the good old days, the good old days? Well, in one sense, yes, if you were there, I'm sure it was wonderful that the name of Jesus was known, and to a, 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 great, a much greater extent, in terms of numbers, honoured in the country. But... I wonder if those people knew what was coming. Just like the people who saw the former glory of the temple, ah, the good old days, but did they know what was coming? And, and, and the people now, decades later, Haggai is speaking to these people who were heartbroken as they remember the incredible temple that used to be there. And it was incredible. It was a remarkable place and a remarkable thing that God had done. If you're able, um, turn over to 1 Chronicles, way back um, in your Bibles, 1 Chronicles chapter 22, and listen to the preparations that King David made for his son Solomon to build the temple. So 1 Chronicles 22 from verse 2 says this, David commanded 
to gather the resident aliens who were in the land of Israel. And he set stone cutters to prepare dressed stones for the building, for building the house of God. David also provided great quantities of iron for nails, for the doors of the gates, and for clamps, as well as bronze in quantities beyond weighing, and cedar timbers without number. For the Sidonians and Tyrians brought great quantities of cedar to David. For David said, Solomon, my son, is young and inexperienced, and the house that is to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent, of fame and glory throughout all lands. I will therefore make preparation for it. So David provided materials in great quantity before his death. And then look down, please, to verse 14. This is now um, David speaking to Solomon. With great pains... I have provided for the house of the Lord a hundred thousand talents of gold. A hundred thousand talents of gold. By the way, let's just pause there for a moment. That's nearly four thousand tons of gold. And if you're anything like me, I had no idea what that would look like. So I, I, I did some googling. I found some images, and this is what ten tons of gold looks like. It's a little bit of a weird picture. I don't know why she's got like you know, dollars all over her couch. But anyway, that's 10 tons of gold. So think of 400 rooms like that. That's how much gold was used in the temple. Or another way to visualize it, here is a truck, and this is the maximum load that a truck could carry. That would be 25 tons of gold. So think of 160 of those trucks. That's how much gold was used in the preparation of the temple. Now, it's not just gold. Let's keep reading from verse 14. Uh, so it's a, a thousand, a hundred thousand talents of gold, a million talents of silver, and bronze and iron beyond weighing, for there is so much of it. Timber and stone too I have provided. To these you must add. You have an abundance of workmen, stone cutters, masons, carpenters, all kinds of craftsmen without number, skilled in working. Gold, silver, bronze, and iron. Arise and work. The Lord is with you. Now. There's other passages that speak of many precious stones that were to be carefully used in the building of the temple. This was an incredible place to be. Now, the, the gold there wasn't to be the end in itself. That wasn't the spectacular thing. The gold was speaking to a much deeper, amazing reality about what this uh, temple was all about. There's so many other passages we could have looked at which, which speak of the exquisite care that was to be taken as the temple was prepared. Listen to this um, from 1 Kings 6-7. It's saying that the, 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 the stone for the temple was to be prepared away from the location of the building of the temple at a quarry so that, listen, quote, neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron was heard in the house while it was being built. Even as it was being built, there was to be this awe and reverence. Now why? It's because of the huge spiritual significance of what this temple was all about. You can read about that in Second Chronicles chapters 5 to 7. I would encourage you just to look over it because you get a glimpse of the amazing reality of what this temple was to be about. God meeting his own people. And as they are dedicating the temple, there's this huge sense of worship and celebration. There's this sense of reverent awe. There's sacrifices beyond words. There's, there's glory and splendor of God that is pointed to and, and welcomed and rejoiced in and wondered at. And all of, the, all of this is to speak of the great God that is there at the temple, there with his people. So just to give you a little taste of that, if you look to 2 Chronicles 7, here Solomon is now praying to dedicate the temple. Listen to what he prays. As soon as, soon as sorry, this is after he prays. He's just prayed this great prayer of dedication. And it says, as soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple, and the priests could not enter the house of the Lord, because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. 
When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. So this really was an incredible place. And you can see then, back in Haggai chapter 2, why Haggai would say to the people, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? This new temple that they were building was nothing compared to what had come before. And they were gutted as they looked on. They needed encouragement from God and it came, it came, it came, comes in this passage. In, in chapter 1, the, the, the call that the, the prophet is, is making from the Lord God is that there is this sense of apathy that has struck the people and they need to be rebuked into that. But here there is a different call. They need encouragement. They're, they're desolate. They're, they're heartbroken. And they need an encouraging word from the Lord. And, and this is what is needed. And, and the word that comes may not on the face of it first of all seem very encouraging the heart of this passage is really that four letter word in our language in verse four work <laughs> work that that's what was needed get to work you're discouraged i know but get to work and, and, and we can relate to that right as we think about the state of the church in the northeast of scotland god's work needs to be done and, and you know how god does his work he does his work through me and you, his body here on earth. Yes, he breaks in in miraculous ways, but he works through his body, empowered by his Holy Spirit. We are his mouth, his hands, his feet, his presence on this land. And we are to, to hear this message, I believe, get to work. That's part of what this book Haggai is all about, encouraging God's people to step forward. Now, I wonder how that lands on you. Can talk community church work? Get to work. Now, if you're on top of the world just now, that will spur you on. You're like, yeah, I'm fired up what Jesus is doing in our midst. Let's keep going. Maybe some of us, not in that place, struggling for whatever reason. So many different reasons we could list. Maybe feeling low, maybe feeling discouraged, maybe feeling unsure if this is the right place for you. Maybe feeling, okay, it's great, we've got a building, but there's so many people who are not receptive. Jesus said, if you're in that place this morning, you're just called to work. It could land very heavily, right? Very difficult. It could even seem cruel or uncaring. Our God is not cruel or uncaring. And just now, as we, that's about, by the way, just don't worry, that's not introduction, that's about half the message done. In, in the last half, I just want us to hear the way that God calls us to work. The way that God calls us to work. Actually, Charlie, maybe you could just fire up the last image. You'll just see these points here before us. As you work, friends, this is the way our God calls us to work. As you work, rest. I mentioned the sense of them not making much progress in the work. Well, that's true just because it was the early days. But another reason was because of the very specific season that this work was happening in. So, um, they were in the midst of a number of major religious festivals at this time, during which they weren't allowed to do any work. Interesting. So, for example, they had their normal Sabbath rest days. No work could be done on those days. Also, on the first day of the month was the Feast of Trumpets. No work was to be done on that day. On the tenth day of this particular month was the Day of Atonement. No work was to be done there. Sorry, when I said the Feast of Trumpets, I said a day, but it was actually a whole week that you weren't able to work during... No, that's not true. Sorry, the Feast of Trumpets was one day, and then it was the 15th day of the month, the Feast of Booths began, and that was a whole week of doing no work. They were to live in these leafy tents, and they were to celebrate to God. They were remembering His protection of them as they walked through the wilderness. Now, here's the fascinating thing. The Feast of Booths was to end on the 22nd day of the month. Cast your eye to chapter 2, verse 1. The Feast of Booths was to end on the 22nd day of the month, and that was, according to Leviticus 23, that was to be a day of solemn rest. 
Listen, look at when Haggai's message to the people comes. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, Haggai, the prophet, ultimately comes and shares God's message. Get to work. And that day is followed by a day of solemn rest to God. When they weren't able to do any work, they were to rest in God. Don't you love it? This is our God, friends. <laughs> yes, there's work to be done. Not before you rest in me. Not before you come to me and just acknowledge, I can't do anything without you, God. You know, this work was needed to get done. But the people of God were told, rest in me. As you work, rest in God. And secondly, make sure, don't do anything before you bring your worship to me. That's what all these fasts, and feast days and solemn rests were all about. They were about putting God and his story of salvation at the very center of the life of God's people. What is God saying to us in this, dear friends? Yes, there is so much work to be done. I don't just mean practical work. I mean, I mean gospel work for us in Kintour Community Church. There's no question of that. There is rebuilding to be done in the church of Jesus Christ in this day. But... If it's only burden, if it's only stress, if it's only angst, if it's only chore, then something is very, very, very wrong. The call here in Haggai chapter 2 is, as you work, rest in me, worship me, come to me, find your hope and your peace in me, just like we've been doing today. May it never be that Kintour Community Church would press forward with ministries or plans or whatever it might be if we're not Deeply committed to, first of all, resting in Jesus, worshipping him, and then allowing that to be the overflow from that place where we say, God, come, rebuild for your sake in this land. So as you work, rest. As you work, worship. Thirdly, as you work, be strong. Be strong. This is not a subtle point in this passage, is it? Three times in verse four, twice underlined by this phrase declares the Lord comes this command be strong or we shouldn't really think of that as a command should we it's more invitation from God be strong why did I say that well we can't be strong in ourselves we if we're to be strong we need God to do it in us we can't do it from our own resources as as we're going to see we're to be strong despite the discouragements around the us. It's just interesting to reflect. Um, one thing worth pondering about Haggai is that his recorded ministry here in this book and in Ezra only lasted three months. We know just three months of what Haggai's life was all about. We don't know what he did. Do you wonder what the rest of his life was like, this man of God? You know, I'm sure he had some highs. There were definitely some lows. But it's just interesting, isn't it, to ponder how he didn't know. I don't think, I don't know, but I suspect that millennia later, we would be reflecting on the word of God that he <coughs> shared with the people of his day. And it's interesting as well for us to reflect on that, right? How, what difference is our work making? Will it have any lasting impact? I'm sure the people who were cutting down trees and stripping them and getting them ready for the, the rebuilding that was happening, I'm sure they were thinking, am I making any difference here? And, and we can feel like that. Are we making any difference? The graph is, is still going down, right? You know, we, can, we can find discouragement in that. And this call comes at the heart of this message. Be strong. Be strong. Now, this is an oft-repeated encouragement, command, invitation in the scriptures isn't it uh, you can think about so many different passages where it says be strong and again just like this call to work and if we're not careful that can be sound quite heavy you think I, i'm weak i don't have anything good to offer it's, it's hard to hear be strong right but in god's kindness that call to be strong doesn't come at us the way that it does in the world the world has a message for us to be strong, but it's, it's, all, it's, it's a mess the way it comes at us. One of the guys I follow on uh, Twitter, or X as it's partly now known, he starts every single day 
with the same tweet. This is what he, he says. Good morning. Today is going to be a great day. Let's get after it relentlessly. That's what he said at the start. You know, he's trying to inspire people, right? Uh, come on, people. This is going to be a great day. Let's get after it relentlessly. And I, I smile at myself reading it in the afternoon because he's American, so he's, he's waking up. And I, I just wonder how many people are just swiping. You know, through, he, he's trying to inspire people. And they're just swiping up through their social media feed. There's lots of different motivations to work in our world, isn't there? Be, be strong so that you can get things done. Be strong and work so that you can contribute to society. Be strong and work to produce goods and services that will make an impact. Be strong and work because it will make you feel good about yourself. Now, some of that can be fine, but it's not how the call of God comes to us. God's call is, yet now, be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work. Why? For I am with you. And this is the next point. As we work <coughs> with our God, remember presence. This passage, this call to, to be strong and work comes in the midst of repeated calls back to God. They'd just been celebrating this feast of booths, this reminder that God was with them, even in the wilderness, even in that difficult season. And here they are now in a different type of wilderness. And again, God promises his presence. Be strong, for I am with you, declares the Lord of heaven's armies. Last part of verse 5, it's just reiterated again. My spirit remains in your midst. This word remains speaks of an ongoing action. I'm with, I was with you. I'm with you now. I will be with you forever. And time and again through the scriptures, this is what is to inspire people as they think about being strong. Be strong, not in your own strength. Be strong, not because of any modern, impressive leadership tech terminology or anything like that, but be strong for I am with you. Even Jesus, as he sends his disciples out, sends them out saying, go, make disciples of all nations. And remember, don't just look back to the good old days. But remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Whatever we do, Jesus and his honor and his glory must be at the very center of it. Yes, we've work to do, but let's remember his presence as we do that. And all of this is possible because of his covenant love. As you work, remember covenant. Work, verse 4, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is in, remains in your midst. The only reason there was a, a people of God at all was because of the covenant that God had made with his people. He was their God and they were his people. And God had showed himself faithful again and again to his covenant. And, uh, and that's what's going on here in Haggai chapter 2. But that wasn't the end of the story as we know. A new covenant was required. And God had already been promising it. A few decades before, God had said through the prophet Jeremiah, I'm reading from Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand, to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. 
And dear friends, this is what we remember every single time we gather together. This is what you will be remembering next Sunday when you share communion together, bread and wine. The, 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 the blood of the new covenant, Jesus said, that he shed for the forgiveness of sins. God is faithful to his promise. And how can it be that God, in, the, in this world of evil that we've been thinking about today, how can it be that our God would be one who forgets iniquity and remembers sin no more? All the injustice, all the evil, all the wrongs that I've done and that we've done and that happen in this world, it's only through the sacrifice of Jesus, whose blood was poured out, the, 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 the fruit of the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. God's call for us to be strong and to be work, uh, is to be strong and work is only because we can do so because of his forgiveness, his covenant love. The fact that he has beaten the power of sin and he will do his work in the northeast of Scotland. So therefore be strong and work for I am with you according to my covenant. And then the last two words of the passage are just so encouraging, aren't they? As you work, fear not. We can trust him, dear friends. We should not fear. I wonder how you look to the coming. I mean, we're, we're in a unique moment in Kintour Community Church, the life of this church family. Because there's markers, right? There's markers along the journey. 2016, when we first started to meet monthly together, and 2017, when the church was officially started, and there's there's different markers. When, when Harley came as pastor, when Harley left as pastor, and we're coming up to a marker just now with this building. I wonder how you look to the coming days. Are you full of excitement? and zeal and joy and expectation? Or are you thinking, how's this gonna go? How's this gonna go? You see that graph? We're, we're there, we're part of this unfolding story. It's so encouraging to me that God says to his people repeatedly again and again, fear not. Fear not. Again, all rooted in his presence with us, his work among us, his covenant faithfulness. Fear not. Fear not. May it not be. Perfect love casts out all fear. As we rest in him, as we worship him, may we not be a people full of fear, but may we be a people filled up with the presence of the Holy Spirit and excited to let that bubble out of us as we participate in this great work of rebuilding that he is doing in our nation, in our day. Let's pray. Lord God, we just come honestly before you and recognize um, there is rebuilding that needs to be done. Lord, we are gutted as we see that graph. And we are gutted as we think about the fact that maybe between 2 and 3% of the people in this region honor you as Lord and King of Kings and Saviour and friend Lord, we recognize there is rebuilding that needs to be done. We recognize that we are small in number in this day. We recognize that it sometimes feels like, what do I have to offer in the midst of all of this? But Lord, we hear your word to us today. Be strong. Work. For I am with you. According to my covenant, fear not. Lord, we thank you so much that you invite us even now to rest. With this great task before us, you invite us to rest. You invite us to come to you again. You invite us to be filled up by your spirit that we might then let those, let the, the beautiful living water of Jesus flow through us to this area much in need. Not in need of more physical rain, but certainly in need of the rain and the living water of you, our great God. We pray, Lord God, that you would use Kintour Community Church for the continued building of your church in this world. We thank you for your spirit among us and at work in us. And we just pray that we would fear not, but we would walk forward confidently, gladly, boldly, expectantly for you and for your sake. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.